Spies, Lies and Exile, British Espionage Double Agents and the Case of George Blake, or should I say George Behar, but we are going to come to that in a minute. And he is going to be introduced by Simon Winder. Um, and I would just like to say uh, uh, a few words about Simon Winder, uh, the uh, discussant today. Uh, Simon will be uh, known to many people as uh, the publishing director of Penguin Books in the UK, um, uh, amongst uh, other lucky authors. I have been lucky enough to work with Simon, I think Simon for 20 years now, uh, and uh, it, it's been an immense privilege, and I've really learned to appreciate his extraordinary qualities, not, not just as a public publisher, but, but, but as a historian uh, and as an intellectual. And uh, remarkably, I think, uh, Simon Winder is not only a publisher, somehow he also finds the time to be an author. Uh, he is the author of three works of nonfiction that have explored the real and imaginary history and the vanished history of Central Europe that started in 2000 and uh, uh, not 2006, must have been 2009-10 with Germania. Uh, and uh, we followed that with a book about Danubia so moving from a real place to a vanished place. And, and then the third in the trilogy, the most recent, Lotharingia, uh, an entirely lost kingdom. But the first book, as far as I know, that Simon Winder wrote uh, was uh, a book about James Bond, the man who saved Britain, the personal journey into the disturbing world of James Bond, which I devoured the minute it came out, and which I still think is not only the most insightful book about Bond, but more importantly, maybe a really important reflection uh, on the state of post-war Britain, a deeply traumatized society, as we now can see, uh, struggling to come to terms with its place in the world. Um, I don't want to say any more than that, except that I can't think of a person better qualified to discuss Simon Cooper's wonderful new book than Simon Winder. And Simon, I'm going to hand over now to you. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Mark. It's very kind of you. Um, um, I'm thrilled to be at this uh, event talking to another Simon. Um, I think all Simons seem to have been born in the 1960s. It seems it's, a, it's a now more or less extinct name, I think, for young, younger people. Um, and to congratulate him on writing this marvelous book about George Blake, uh, which I really can't recommend too highly. Um, and um, Simon is going to talk to us about uh, his book uh, for about uh, 25 minutes or so. Um, Simon uh, uh, has written a number of key books on football and on the Netherlands, and uh, is uh, writes for the Financial Times. And um, um, the book is called The Happy Traitor in the UK, uh, but it's called Spies, Lies and Exile in the US, uh, which is an interesting tension um, in itself. But I'll turn over to you, Simon, and then um, I might interject occasionally, but I think I should generally leave you alone. And then we can have a conversation um, after you've talked, and then I hope other people will want to chip in as well. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Hello, everyone, wherever you are. I hope you can hear me. I'm coming to you from Paris. And yeah, this book about George Blake is my first venture into the world of espionage. And it started really 20 years ago. I'm going to talk you through a little bit of how I came to be writing about Blake and then about this man's extraordinary life, which I've learned to describe as a one-man Netflix series. So, George Blake, I'm going to show you a picture of him if the, if the screen sharing works. Let's see, here we go. I think you can see now an old man sitting in the garden of his dacha outside Moscow with his little terrier on his lap. This is George Blake as I saw him and I photographed him the day I met him in May 2012. The story really goes back to about 1999. I grew up in the Netherlands, as did Blake, and I was reading in a Dutch magazine at the time an interview with him, and I was sort of flabbergasted at the brilliance of his story and also at some similarities between him and me, although I am not and never have been a KGB double agent. Blake 
was born in the Netherlands to a Dutch Protestant mother in Rotterdam and a father who was a Constantinople Jew who had fought in World War I for the French and in the British Army and as a reward had been given British citizenship. So the father had pitched up in Rotterdam at the armistice, trying to help British POWs uh, to be repatriated from Germany to the UK. And in Rotterdam, he'd met Blake's mother. And in 1922, on armistice day, Blake was born. And that in fact is why he is called George. He was called, um, named George Bihar by his father, Albert Bihar. So that was his birth name, George, because in a fit of patriotism on the way to the registry office, Albert decided to name him after the king. So Blake grows up, George Behar, in Rotterdam, goes through this long journey, which I'm going to describe, becomes a KGB agent and ends his life, dies in Moscow on last Boxing Day, age 98. So I read about this story about this Dutchman with British roots. Uh, Blake was half Jewish. I'm Jewish. We had a lot in common. We grew up about 20 miles apart in the Netherlands, both of us Dutch and English speakers. And so when I read this profile, this interview with him in 1999, I thought I would love to interview that man one day. Um, what a fascinating story. And then in 2012, when this picture was taken, I was visiting Moscow for a conference. And I had asked a Dutch friend of mine there, Derek Sauer, who's a kind of media magnet. He uh, edits, publishes the Moscow Times. And he had, during Perestroika, started publishing Russian editions of Cosmopolitan and Playboy, became a media magnet there, owned his Vestia, and was a friend of Blake's. So I said to Derek, you know, maybe you could introduce me to your mate Blake. And he, and I could interview him for a Dutch newspaper. So he called Blake and Blake phoned me and Blake interviewed me first, because being a double agent, he was a suspicious type. And so I was walking around the cemetery in Moscow that day, where um, looking for the graves of Chekhov and Khrushchev. And on my phone, I'm talking to Blake in Dutch, and he speaks with this very posh pre-war Rotterdam accent, hard tones of Rotterdam. And he's trying to ascertain what I'm going to ask him. And I know from Derek that the thing Blake doesn't want to talk about, oddly, is Putin, because he loathed Putin. But he depended on Putin for this dacha and for his pension and his wife's pension. So I said to him, look, you know, Mr. Blake, I don't want to ask you about contemporary Russian politics. I want to talk about your life and spying career. So he said, fine, come on over to my dacha. So one Saturday morning, Derek sent his chauffeured car and we drove through the Saturday morning traffic jams out into the countryside. Um, it was 2012. Moscow was already at its peak of wealth and well-beings before the invasion of Russia. The oil price is $100 a barrel. People look very middle class. I walked down this country lane and there waiting for me, this little man with his dog and a cane. And we go into the garden of the dacha and he points very proudly to his dacha, given him by the KGB. And he says, this dacha is actually pre-revolutionary sort of mark of quality. And then we spend the day together uh, speaking Dutch at his request because he said, I so rarely get the chance to. And we talk through his life. And Blake grows up in Rotterdam, but when he's 12, 13, his father dies and a letter arrives. His father had been wounded in a gas attack in World War I, had always been unwell, had seen his death coming. So when he dies, a letter arrives from the father's sister in Cairo where she is married to a banker living in this mansion. And she says to George's mother, well, your family obviously is now stricken financially. So why doesn't George come to live with us? And so this very pious Protestant Dutch boy who doesn't speak very much English at all, has hardly ever been outside the country, gets on a boat and goes to live in this fabulous mansion in Zamalek in the center of Cairo uh, with his aunt's family, French speaking Egyptian Jews, of enormous wealth. They have a kind of cotton plantation. The father's a banker. And so Blake lives in this house, goes to a French school, goes to the British school in Cairo and becomes in these three school years in Cairo, he becomes an international person. Um, he learns that with his gift for languages, he learns English and French very rapidly. He learns some Arabic. He can cope anywhere. He can land on his feet. Then in 1939, 
I'm going to take you through his life and Simon, feel free to interrupt. He's back in the Netherlands on a school holiday when World War One, World War Two breaks out. And so it's felt that he should stay with his mother and sisters instead of going back to Cairo. And then in May 1940, during the German invasion, there's the bombardment of Rotterdam, leaving this moon landscape. It's one of the first cities really in the world to be destroyed by this new technology. And Blake experiences the bombardment under the kitchen table with a pan over his head. And I think this stays with him. At this point, he's 17 years old. It's a very formative moment. And he realizes your world, the world can be destroyed. He starts to feel there is this war, it's an existential war. He decides he's gonna fight against the Nazis. He's British, he's Jewish. He's a very uh, patriotic Dutchman and he goes into the resistance. And so he becomes a courier for a Dutch resistance group, taking out around messages, delivering newspapers. You know, most of the Dutch resistance is very non-violent, small country, nowhere to hide. And after a year or two of doing this, you know, so very early on, he's getting used to the secret life. After a couple of years, he feels, I'm good at this. I'm a naturally secretive person. I'm ideologically committed, but I wanna play in the big league. And the big league means going to England and joining the secret intelligence service, which he's heard about, which he sees as the kind of secret power at the heart of the world. And amazingly, he makes it to Britain in 1943. He flees through occupied Belgium and France, makes it to Spain and is put on a boat to England and pitches up in London where his mother and sisters had fled after the German invasion. He's reunited with them. So in England, he initially joins the Navy and he's put on these kind of kamikaze mini submarines, these two man submarines that blow up German boats and then try to get away. But in training, it's found that he passes out while underwater. So he is uh, manifestly unsuited. Happily, his dream comes true because he's a Dutch speaker and a German speaker. He is recruited through the offices of Kenneth Cohen, a major British um, secret service agent to SIS, the secret intelligence service. And he joins the Dutch service and his role is to help Dutch parachutists um, land in the occupied Netherlands and send messages back. Very, very, he, uh, he accompanies these young men. Many of them will die as they land in, in the Netherlands. And so he feels he's involved in the war. And after the war, you know, he'd wanted to become a pastor, but he goes after the war to the occupied Netherlands, the liberated Netherlands, and then to occupy Germany in 1945, 1947. And he partakes quite fully in the kind of wine, women, and song that are available to the occupying forces. And he, he's ashamed of himself. He feels he's no longer equipped for his vocation as a Calvinist pastor. And happily, SIS recruits him full time. They say, look, George, you're good with languages. Uh, you're a good chap. You're not really one of us, but you can join SIS. And they send him to Cambridge to learn Russian for a year. And he falls for Russian culture, the Russian language. They also give him this book to read, this booklet called The Theory and Practice of Communism, written by an old SIS hand, Carew Hunt, which is meant to kind of teach SIS recruits about what communism is but it's unintentionally persuasive. And George comes to feel, he's renamed himself George Blake, by the way, to anglicize his name. George Blake comes to feel that there might be something in this communism thing. And of course, it seems to replace the religion that he is losing. So SIS and its wisdom spends, then send this trained Russian speaker, this fluent German speaker to Korea, where he doesn't speak the language, doesn't know anything about the country. But it's 1950 and SIS can see the Korean War coming. So Blake's job is going to be to be in Korea as an observer. When war breaks out, he'll stay there. Britain's going to be neutral and he will um, observe the war and send messages back. But then in 1950, when the North Koreans duly invade, to his horror, it turns out that Britain is actually going into the war as America's ally, or as he sees it more as America's poodle. This is the start of Britain's kind of playing second fiddle to the US, he's very disillusioned. He thought he'd been serving a great empire, it turns out Britain is no longer a great empire, it's just doing America's bidding. He and other British diplomats are taken prisoner, they go on this horrendous prison march with other captured clerics, diplomats, journalists, and 700 American POWs. Lots of the POWs drop dead, Blake concludes Americans are soft, 
He sees American bomber planes demolish lots of Korea, you know, as we know, enormous destruction of the Korean War. And he comes to feel these Americans are softies, but they're violent. I don't want to be fighting on their side. The communist resistance, which he comes to identify in South Korea, which he comes to identify with the Dutch resistance, he sees them as the good guys. And in North Korean captivity, he has this epiphany when, you know, at one point he's being held after the death match in this quiet farmhouse with other diplomats and journalists. A package of books arrives from the Soviet embassy in Pyongyang. And there's one book in English, Treasure Island by Stevenson. And they draw lots who gets to read it first and they read it to pieces within days. And there are two books in Russian, Lenin, State and Revolution, and Marx's Das Kapital, Russian translation. So Blake and the British consul in Korea, Vivian Hunt, can read Russian. They sit on a grave hill for months reading Das Kapital in Russian twice. You know, probably the only people to have ever done so voluntarily. And they conclude together that communism is the future. And Hunt is an old British servant of empire. He served in Iraq and India, but he says to Blake, look, I regret to say, but I think the communism thing is gonna take over. And Blake is very persuaded by this. And one night he hands the North Korean camp guard a note in Russian for the Russian embassy, the Soviet embassy. He has decided to go over to the KGB. KGB agent Nikolai Loenko is sent, interrogates Blake, gets him to write out the structure of SIS, the organizational structure. The KGB then matches this with the organizational structure of SIS as described to them by Kim Philby, a previous defector, uh, or traitor, sorry, at this point. Philby and Blake's accounts match. The KGB trusts Blake, he is recruited. So then Stalin dies, the Korean War very rapidly, more or less ends uh, in the thaw post Stalin. And Blake and the other British prisoners are returned home in some style, they're given new suits. And here they are, you see them arriving at Abingdon RAF base, 1953. And they're greeted by great crowds, you know, these. Um, these men, these diplomats, these uh, clerics, they're greeted as returning heroes. But Blake, as he comes down the steps of the airplane and he hears the hymn being played for them, he feels these people do not realize that I am no longer who they think they are because he is now a KGB agent. He's also in always, in any moment, juncture of his life, greeted by his mother. He was a tremendous mummy's boy and she lived happily until her late 90s so she was with him at crucial moments of his life and she is there to greet him when he returns but for the next eight years his job is to send every british secret every document he can lay his hands on every agent's name to give them to his kgb handlers in london he passes them on on you know rainy street corners it's very much a noir film in um Belsize park in the suburban London train stations, on the top decks of double-decker buses. He hands over all the documents he lays his hands on. At lunchtime, when the other spies are out in the pubs and clubs of the West End, he takes his tiny Minox camera out of his back pocket and photographs documents for the KGB. And the most important secret he gives away is the Berlin spy tunnel. The British and Americans built this together in 1954 because they wanted to find out what the Soviets in East Berlin were discussing. So they built this tunnel under Berlin to listen in to Soviet phone conversations. And this is very important because at this moment in the Cold War, the Americans and British have no idea what the Soviets are thinking. Is Khrushchev the new Soviet leader? Is he a peacemaker or is he a warmonger? Are the Soviets gonna launch a sudden attack? Is there going to be a new Soviet Pearl Harbor or worse, a Soviet Hiroshima? Nobody knows. And so this spy tunnel is the way to find out what the Soviets are up to. But the secretary taking the minutes at the meeting where it's decided to build the tunnel is George Blake. So within days, long before the tunnel is built, the KGB knows about it. But now the KGB has this terrible dilemma regarding the tunnel, which is if they, if they blow the tunnel, show that they know about it, then the British and Americans will realize, well, there is a mole and very quickly suspicion will fall on Blake. But the Soviets prize Blake so much that they don't want to jeopardize him. You know, they have this man in the center of the belly of the beast, 
at SIS in London, and they'll do nothing to jeopardize his position. So KGB take this momentous decision to let the spy tunnel operate for, in the end, 11 months. And the KGB don't even tell most KGB agents in Berlin, let alone their rivals in the Red Army and the GRU, the Red Army Intelligence Agency. So they just let the Soviet phone conversations kind of go over authentically. Everything that the British and Americans hear in those 11 months, we believe now, was actually authentic. And what is it? What do they hear? What are the Soviets discussing at this crucial moment of the Cold War? They're discussing the officers' sex in very large, uh, long conversations with enormous obscenities. Um, they, the, the transcribers have to keep a file marked Soviet obscenities. And then they discuss, of course, the incompetence of their own officers. I mean, there's some interesting tidbits, like they learn more about the positions of the Soviet army in East Germany. They get the first kind of rumors of Khrushchev's secret speech to the, um, of the 1956 uh, Communist Party Congress. And they, most of all, they don't hear anything scary. The Soviets are not planning an attack. The Soviets do not want to invade. And so no news is good news is very much the message of the spy tunnel. In April 1955, the KGB uh, arranges for the tunnel to be sort of accidentally discovered after heavy rains in Berlin, and the thing is ditched. But actually, it was a very important window onto the um, onto Soviet thinking or non-thinking in this period. So Blake this, didn't. This amazing photo is this is this the whole thing or a little bit of it? This is a little bit of it. I mean, the tunnel I believe was several hundred meters long. Uh, it ran through the American. Uh, sector right under the Soviet zone. And we have these photos, partly the Americans took them, but also when the Soviets blew it, they invited the Western press corps to do a tour of it. So uh, we know quite a lot about what the tunnel looked like. And through it, they could listen to how? What, they were tapping into telephone networks? Or? They were tapping into telephone uh, lines, yes. And I think uh, telegraph lines as well. So they had an enormous quantity. It took them, I think, several more years to just transcribe all the conversations they had overheard. It was just an enormous amount of work. By, by which time the um, value of those conversations was diminished considerably, presumably. Yeah, I think a lot of people probably wasted years of their careers doing this, um, but that was the Cold War. Exactly. So the other thing that Blake gave away was hundreds of names of British agents working behind the Iron Curtain. I say British agents, agents of Britain, most of them Eastern Europeans. And he has always said none of these agents were hurt. He told the KGB not to hurt them. I'm sure he told the KGB not to hurt them. Of course, the KGB totally ignored this. And in 1961, when the British finally work out that Blake is a mole and they kind of try to work out what damage he's done, they calculate that about 40 of the agents whose names he'd given to the Soviets were executed. And so, in effect, Blake was a serial killer. He has always denied this, including in my conversation with him, he was never able to face it. But that is uh, what seems to have happened. Many other people spent years and years in jail after being betrayed by Blake. Uh, I found one East German who'd spent 16 years in jail and was finally released, bought out by West Germany in 1976. So he will probably not have uh, been a very happy, uh, been a great friend of Blake's. So Blake is then locked up in Wormwood Scrubs in London. He's given a 42 year sentence, which is the longest in modern British history at that point. But the thing about British prisons in the 1960s was it was not difficult to escape. So uh, prisoners were escaping all the time. And in 1966, Blake, who had been a kind of benevolent prison professor teaching the largely working class fellow prisoners French and German and Arabic, writing letters to the authorities on their behalf, uh, doing yoga, so he could stand on his head for 15 minutes. He uh, had always been preparing his escape and he arranged for a fellow prisoner, the Irishman Sean Burke, to throw up a, a nylon a uh, rope ladder made of knitting needles up this wall. Blake had got to the top of the wall that you see here uh, because a friendly robber on the inside had broken a window. Blake was on the top of the wall. Burke showed up in his little Humber car, uh, 
through the rope ladder, had forgotten to give anything Blake anything to attach the rope ladder to. So Blake still had to jump off the wall, which, as you see, is quite a drop for a 43-year-old man. And the other thing is that just across this little street in Hammersmith is Hammersmith Hospital, where visiting hour was about to begin. So it was quite a scary operation. Blake jumps down in the rain, breaks his wrist, Burke shoves him into a car and drives him 700 yards to a bed sit that he's rented nearby. It's a fantastically amateurish escape. It's like something out of a comic book. But it's also so spectacular that Alfred Hitchcock was transfixed by it, would buy the rights to Burke's fantastic memoir and another book. And Hitchcock spent the last decade of his life trying to make a film about Blake's escape. Because after a couple of months hiding in Hampstead at the house of a friendly peacenik, who felt Blake's sentence was inhumane, Blake is smuggled in the bottom of a camper van on a kind of family holiday of this peacenik and um, his wife and children into West Berlin. They drive to West Berlin, uh, take the ferry, Dover, Calais, et cetera. And in Berlin, Blake walks up to an East German border guard and says, I would like to speak to someone from the KGB. So Hitchcock found this such a brilliant story that uh, he spent his last decade trying to turn it into film, originally with Sean Connery and Liv Ullman. And unfortunately, Hitchcock uh, developed Alzheimer's and various other ailments and then died in 1980, having given up the project. So Blake is then in Moscow. And I said to him, look, you know, what did you think when in 19, the end of 1966, you arrive in Brezhnev's Moscow, which is a gloomy, repressive place with not much food. And this, you'd given your life for this ideal of communism, you'd left behind your British wife and your three young sons, one of whom was born after you were put in jail. You'd really sacrificed a lot. What did you think when you arrived in Moscow and saw what it was like? And remember Guy Burgess, who also defected to Moscow, said the Soviet Union was like Glasgow on a Saturday night in the 19th century, which is the best description I have read. And Blake said to me, look, after a week, I realized communism didn't work. And the thing is that unlike Philby and Burgess, for whom the Soviet Union was exiled, these were Englishmen who yearned for England, Blake was a cosmopolitan. He spoke good Russian. He knew he could adapt anywhere, and he adapted. And he decided, look, I'm going to make a new life for myself here. I'm just going to make this thing work. Of course, um, this is uh, the KGB refused to give him a job because they distrust him. How could anyone escape so easily from jail? Surely MI6, as the British Foreign Intelligence Agency was now called, must have had a hand in it. MI6 had sprung him on the Soviets, they suspected. So they just kind of sent him on this long holiday. And here he's showing off his proudly developed upper torso, his jail body, because um, I guess he didn't have much else to do. Uh, happily for him, his mother, of course, was always there. She moved in with him in his flat. And Burke lived with him for a while as well. Uh, the peaceniks had sent Burke to Moscow because to get him out of the way because he had a propensity to chatter. And in fact, he wanted to publicize his role in Blake's escape because he was writing a book about it. It was kind of his real life artwork. Burke and Blake lived together for a few months. It was not a happy cohabitation. Burke was messy, Blake was neat. And in the end, Burke goes back to Ireland and publishes his book. Uh, Blake's mummy comes over. Uh, she made uh, many long stays in the Soviet Union while she was still fit enough to. And so he develops this new life. Uh, and I caught him towards the end of that. He marries Ida, who's a French translator. And they have a son, Misha. And then to his great delight in the 80s, his British sons make contact with him. And he said to me, the greatest happiness of my life is that I have reestablished my first family while also having a second family. So he kind of disillusioned with communism. He believes in Gorbachev for a while. Gorbachev is going to bring this communism with a human face that Blake always wanted. And then in the end, he sort of gives up on ideals after the Soviet Union collapses. And he just finds happiness in the bosom of his family, reading while he still can, while his eyes are good enough, listening to music. And he sort of uh, goes back to Christianity. It's the faith that never deserted him. This is his apartment in Moscow when he was still living in town. You see the orthodox icons. He loved the beauty of orthodox Christianity. And so this KGB was actually quite suspicious of him, partly because he was a Christian. And so he had this slightly arm's length relationship with them. But then uh, when he turned 90, just after my visit, Putin gave him the order of Lenin. You know, he was always kind of bigged up as this hero of the Soviet Union. And, uh, you know, Putin made this kind of um, 
beautiful speech about him when he died. So he, um, he, he died in, in comfort, age 98. Last slide I want to show is I, um, when I researched the book, I mean, I spent years after that first meeting where I was too charmed by him. I liked him too much. It was a very kind of um, easy conversation and uh, gripping, and he was able to reflect on his life. I then spent years reading everything there was to read about him, and I got a lot of my sourcing sources from the Stasi, the archives of the East German secret police, where Blake made four long speeches about his life which were recorded happily by the Stasi between 1976 and 1980. And the Stasi itself, as was its custom, assembled a long file on Blake, which I was able to read because the great thing about all the Stasi documents is that they are now public, although some names are eradicated. So having spoken to him and then seen his four testimonies to the Stasi has given me suddenly his view of himself and coupled with what little documentation there is because the MI6 file on Blake remains closed, partly because I think his case was so embarrassing and probably will remain closed for a very long time. But so I've had to, I suppose like most people writing about espionage, had to assemble from small materials this attempt to understand this man and um, what propelled this very bizarre life. I hope you'll read the book. I'm going to show it just once. Spies, Lies and Exile, as Simon says, just out in the US and it's the happy traitor in Britain. That was my brief publicity moment. Simon, I hope I haven't spoken too long. No, that was perfect. Thank you, Simon. That was brilliant. Uh, and I don't, it's hard to know where to start because it's such a suggestive and interesting book. And also, I have to be said, it's just the right length. Which, this is an incredibly important issue that there's a verbosity about a lot of stuff about the Cold War, which this book completely avoids. It's extremely terse. Um, and in some places, I kind of felt that there was, I like books where you feel there's a lot being held back. It's, it's just a tremendously interesting series of things you're writing about. But one thing that crossed, I mean, there's a number of things that crossed my mind when reading it. There's one, like now I suppose I'm in my late fifties and I was really struck by a number of things. One, that my children are all now adults, and one of whom is having a baby in a couple of weeks, and that they have literally no experience of the Cold War. You know, that, that from their point of view, even as children, they missed it. And yet, for anyone who's now in their 50s, or certainly even in their 40s, you know, it is the, the, the single most important thing, and therefore the, the, how to convey this to a new generation or whether you want to convert to a new generation is really an interesting question. The other thing that struck me was the way that one of the oddities of being in your late 50s, I feel, is that you're, you're, it's suddenly revealed to you that actually humans are around for quite a long time, though not very long, um, but enough time to see huge changes in our relationship with history. So, uh, for example, when you think about the period of... Um, you know, say the Russian Revolution mysteriously is now closer to the to the time of Beethoven's death than it is to us. You know, the Russian Revolution has become a very, very old event rather than quite a recent event. But then equally, if you're looking at um, the period around Blake's uh, arrest, the early 60s, you know, when you think about Blake's arrest and also the great Cold War movies of that period, things like Dr. Strangelove or Manchurian Candidate or Kiss Me Deadly, you know, these remarkable films, which again, growing up, going to see them in London in revivals in the late 70s, they were, they were old, new films. Those films over the past decades have now, and Blake's own arrest, are now closer in time to the Edwardian period than they are to us. And yet, say, Dr. Strangelove continues to be seen as this Icon, icon of modernity, and yet it's actually a very, very old film. And similarly, seeing the, the listening in tunnel, the, te the technology in the listening to the tunnel, um, now just looks sort of um, uh, Pete Robinson in its kind of uh, tangled oldness. And one of the things I think going forward for everybody interested in this topic will be how to reimagine that this period, uh, this era, this very long period of the Cold War, um, where 
the assumptions around it at the time seemed almost self-evident. Uh, and yet the aftermath is, is strangely uh, muted. Um, like I'm really struck, for example, I mean, like everybody, like say in publishing, uh, or like in every walk of life, everyone is now very concerned about uh, re-examining ideas around discrimination on the basis of race or sex. And, um, and this is viewed, and the era of Trump is viewed as being a uniquely polarized period and, and sort of, uh, regrettable and sort of dangerously polarized. And yet, I suppose my feeling looking back is that we're not faintly as polarized as people would have been during the course of the High Cold War, uh, and that the level of danger in the world is a tiny percentage of what it was at that point, and that we continue in a way to be very lucky. And yet time still goes by. And I thought it was fascinating that you'd seen Blake really quite recently, you know, that, 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 that he was the, and he was the last spy, wasn't he, Simon? I mean, that, that, there were no more alive. Yeah, I think he's the last Cold War defector in Moscow who's still alive, who was still alive until Boxing Day. But again, it's like, it shows how oddly long life is. You know, you can tack on an extra 30 years or something after you've retired. And that really does get you into a quite different era, both technologically, emotionally, intellectually. I mean, it's a very, very long time ago that he had his experiences. And did you, did you feel any kind of um, close, you say you liked him. Do, do you feel that was because he was superficially charming or you felt some kind of empathy? I think part of having a very long life is that to some degree you become different people and to some degree you you become superannuated. So what you did becomes very far away from you in a long retirement, especially when the era in which you lived has disappeared. So I was charmed by him. And, you know, people say spies are charming. I'm not sure. I don't think spies particularly need to be charming. I think, you know, we, we had things in common. He was a very bright man. And I think it's partly the journalist in me. Journalists tend to be quite gregarious people. We, you know, our job is involves sort of unlike with academics say, in some ways our, our work is like that of academics, but in other ways we have to actually go out and meet lots of people to get information. So we tend to be quite sociable and we like the people we're talking to. So I think if I'd just written an article after leaving the house that day, it would have been way too positive. But happily, I then, a couple of years later, it, the, the, the story, the interview kept bugging me. I kept thinking that's the best interview I've done. And eventually I decided I have to find time to turn this into a book. So, you know, what was I charmed? I think that when you're talking to somebody in 2012 about the Cold War, you really are together trying to inter an era that is completely dead. That of course, Blake had lived intimately, that I had lived, you know, I remember as a teenager lying awake at night, anxious that the world would be destroyed by nuclear bombs. This was around the time that Ronald Reagan said we could have a limited nuclear war in Europe. And, um, you know, so you're really discussing history. So there's something dispassionate about it. You know, this, nobody can do anything anymore about this era. We are not in this era anymore. The distance of the Cold War to us has been brought home to me recently, talking to my children about it, especially my daughter who's studying it at school. And, you know, how do you start to explain what communism is? You know, when I was growing up, communism was a real thing. And now it, it's a sort of, to my children, it's this abstract ideology that seems bizarre that anyone ever thought would, would be a thing, would work. Yes, there are hundreds and hundreds of millions of communists. You know, it's not a, yes, it was not a... Uh... It was not a marginal movement. Uh, no, I mean, it, it dominated nearly half the world. And yet now it just seems, I mean, as far away from us as some medieval scholastical debate in philosophy. So, yeah, I mean, he, Blake had inhabited worlds that don't exist anymore. He had inhabited the resistance. He had inhabited the Korean War, uh, then the Cold War. So, yeah, I very much felt, I think I'm at heart, although a journalist at heart, a historian, I very much felt that I was in the presence of history. And there's something tragic about being history yourself. It means that your story is over. And I felt with Blake that his story sort of ended, certainly when the Soviet Union collapses, maybe as early as 1966, when he leaves jail. Yes, because that's one of the, I thought, one of the most interesting aspects of the book was that you take his 
faith quite seriously. You know, that he was clearly a man who had strong beliefs. And uh, as you say, the sort of the communism which he embraced now seems a sort of scholastic thing. And yet it had a, a practical day in, day out plausibility. I'm not quite mind it was people wouldn't imagine anything outside it, as it were. Um, and so, Blake, but Blake is a fascinating figure to see it through because of the way that once he's in the Soviet Union, of course, he has to experience the reality of it rather than the idea of it. Yeah, I mean, the thing about Blake is that he was not a cynic. He was a genuine believer, which is part of the disaster of the whole story. And he actually had two faiths that have now largely died. The other is extreme fundamentalist Calvinism, which he grew up with, a form of Calvinism that said that everything is preordained. Everything we do is God's will, so we have no free will of our own at all. And so it's quite easy for him, for him to go from that to communism where, you know, all of history is preordained. So he had, he kind of was an exemplar of two dead faiths, which is, which is very um, surprising to me. The other thing I had in mind, I mean, this is all sort of ahistorical thinking, but while I was writing the book, you know, I live in Paris, I cycle to this little office where you see me every day, I cycle past the Bataclan, the nightclub where you know 95 people were killed that night in November 2015 around the time I was starting to write this book and so I had very much in mind Blake as a uh, precursor of the modern day jihadis because he too was a westerner who felt his own society was impure he himself was impure because of the wine women and song he'd enjoyed uh, in, you know uh, in 1945-47 in the Netherlands and Germany and he had to purify himself by adopting this faith that uh, you know, took place in a foreign country for him in the USSR, for the jihadis in Iraq, Syria, for the ISIS generation. And so, um, yeah, he's a kind of, we in the West don't really produce true believers anymore. We, we you know, we have more either cynics like Trump who don't believe anything or uh, sort of fiddly pragmatists like Biden, I guess, who want to make things a little bit better based on old ideas. So Biden is sort of FDR recast or presents himself that way. There is nothing new there. There are no ideals there. There is no utopia. Blake was a man of utopias. I mean, the, just by accident, like, I've just been finished reading Max Hastings' excellent uh, book on the Korean War, um, which is just lying around. And I suddenly thought, ooh, Blake's going to turn up in this. And sure enough, there he is. Um, but one of the fascinating things that Hastings says, which I hadn't really thought of, was that, because on the face of it, he comes back and uh, he would seem to be a walking disaster to if someone's been in North Korean or Chinese captivity for two years, um, you know, you would imagine that you'd be severely cross-examined. Um, but one of the points Hastings makes is that we that this idea of like the Manchurian candidate of the idea that somehow this these brainwashed figures could be sent back, is saying what's one of the oddities is that actually there are hardly any of them. You know, at least we're not aware of, perhaps they're so brilliantly managed that they weren't, they, that we never knew. And in fact, various key figures in British society were always venturing candidates. But, but, but the, what was odd about Blake was that he um, did convert. Um, and that actually, there are almost no other examples of someone converting in that way. I mean, there are people, say, the, the famous Cambridge spies, obviously, that was an intellectual process. But in effect, he actually switches uh, in a way which is very, very unusual. And that therefore, maybe you're a bit harsh on their failure to spot the fact that he. I love that photo in the book of him with all these wonderfully establishment figures, like the sort of the missionary priest and so on. And that in that setting, he would have seemed just another person who. I mean, that, that, that was, 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 were there other precedents before Blake which would have made his handlers think that they ought to have checked him more carefully? Well, when Blake returns from Korea in 1953, it's, I think, two years after McLean and Burgess have defected to the Soviet Union. And Philby is already under extreme suspicion of being a Soviet agent. So the British did know this stuff happened. And although you're right, I can't think of any cases of people who are brainwashed in some kind of, um, you know, childlike way and become communists in Korean captivity. This was a belief that was held at the time. You know, they did think people were being brainwashed. And yet, you know, Blake shows up and SIS are very much, oh, good chap, Blake, uh, take a few months leave and we'll see you in September. And- uh, I see what you mean. So there weren't any brainwashed people, but if you believe that there were brainwashed people, then here comes- 
the one person most likely to be brainwashed. Well, the thing is that, I mean, the North Koreans do seem to have attempted very primitive propaganda methods on the prisoners, you know, shouting at them, Mark says, Lenin says. But, I mean, I guess A, because of the language barrier, and B, because the Koreans are not very well up on Marx or Lenin, and the British and French prisoners, the, the eight men that Blake was with, were, you know, quite intellectual types. Uh, this did not go down well with the prisoners. Uh, Philip Dean, the observer journalist, said we had to correct their quotations of Marx sometimes. And so this kind of unsophisticated, I think the North Koreans did attempt this unsophisticated brainwashing, total failure, didn't work. What worked with Blake was sort of a religious style study of Marx, which was very like the biblical study that he had done voluntarily as a Bible obsessed child. So he, he sort of, if you like, he brainwashed himself without North Korean help. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, that's, that's another of the fascinating things. Obviously, here we are many, many years later, but the, the, the events which made Blake switch were very close to the Second World War, you know, like it's no, it's not much more dis distant between his going to Korea um, and the end of the Second World War and us and say the Brexit referendum. You know, it's, it's, it's not, it's a, it's a short period in anyone's career. And again, one of the frustrations I feel is how difficult it is to convey to oneself, let alone to other people, how nearby these events are, how you know, the, 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 the degree to which the Soviets and the British are working very, very closely, very shortly before these events. Yeah, I think that like probably almost everyone of that generation, Blake was a child of World War II. He always carried World War II with him. And he took from World War II a couple of messages. One is the world is a struggle between good and evil. And another is the Soviets are essentially on our side. And you have to commit as a soldier to this struggle. So when he gets to Korea in 1950, and he sees this country that is kind of South Korea essentially ruled by the Americans, he feels very much this is like the Netherlands under German rule. And the South Korean education minister worships Hitler and the communist resistance is the Dutch resistance. And then when he sees Korean villages being bombed by Americans, he feels this is like the German destruction of my hometown Rotterdam. So I think he very much places it in the continuum of World War II and he had already committed his life to what he saw as the good evil struggle. And then the question becomes, but have you correctly identified good and evil? In Korea, he felt he had not. He felt that he in the end was fighting on the side of the evil West and had to switch. He also had this kind of early sort of anti-colonialist vision, which will become much more common during the Vietnam War, which is why are we Western powers interfering in this country? Why are we fighting a war about what Korea should become when that should be for the Koreans to decide? So it's very much like the critiques of Viet the Vietnam War that you're gonna hear 15 years later. I thought another thing, I mean, this is often best my, I just finished editing Richard Overy's amazing new book, which we're publishing the Penguin and Wharton called Blood and Wounds, which is, a sort of has been working on for years, and which is a recasting of the Second World War as being essentially uh, the last great imperialist war. He's saying really it's, it's, it's a summation of a hundred years or more of European divvying up of the world. And that the, 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 the Japanese, German, and Italian variants of it effectively introduce a hysteria, but also a kind of, it's the last frontier and effectively the end of the war breaks the very idea of colonial empires and effectively all territorial empires have ended really within a generation beyond certain bits of the Soviet Union and that the, 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 this is both the cause and the result of the Second World War rather than being a separate process and because I was editing this when reading your book I was very struck by the wonderful material you have describing this um, now long lost French Jewish, French speaking Jewish Egyptian world, um, which is obviously one of the many um, co bits of collateral damage to this process, post war process of decolonization. And the degree to which, in many ways, Blake not only grows up in this sort of Dutch Calvinist world, but also a world in Egypt which is about to cease to exist. Um, um, and all over the world, um, 
many, many minorities in countries across the whole of Eurasia effectively are being eradicated or kicked out or fleeing um, as part of the same process of, ethnic, of an attempted ethnic um, clean, cleansing within national boundaries, which had previously not been relevant because of the, the grip of the Ottoman Empire, the Russian Empire, French Empire, and so on. Um, and one of the figures in the book I thought was most interesting, I thought you, I want to ask if you could talk briefly about him, is this guy, Henri Curiel. Is that how it's pronounced? Curiel, is it? Or? Curiel, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, who is like uh, obviously an important figure for Blake, but also in himself tells you a lot about the world in which uh, Blake is operating and which is coming to an end. Yeah, I'll just show you the villa again while I briefly describe it. So this is the Villa Curiel, which the uh, Henri Curiel and his brother Raoul would later hand to the Algerian state. And it's now the Algerian embassy in Cairo, if you should ever visit. So he, Blake arrives in this house in 1953 and the uh, Curiel brothers, the sons of the family, are um, young men. Henri is eight years older than Blake. And Henri is a very dashing, handsome, charismatic young chap who is becoming a communist. And Henri is developing a kind of anti-colonial critique that, um, you know, the Egyptians are being suppressed by the Europeans and that his father's uh, cotton estate where, you know, children are laboring and people are dying all the time, that this is wrong. And Curiel's communism doesn't really persuade Blake because Blake is this very pious little teenager at this point. But it does, I think, make an impact. And like Curiel, he sees in Egypt, where life expectancy is about 30, 32 at this point, he sees this immense wealth in which he lives, cheek by jowl with this terrible poverty. So he has a similar experience in a way to the Cambridge Five at that same time in the 1930s in England, you know, who lived this life of privilege alongside the depression in Britain. And so Henri, he founds one of Egypt's communist parties. All the Egyptian communist parties of the era seems to have been founded by Cairo Jews. And he gets all his mates and his girlfriends to join. And then in um, 1948, with the Arab-Israeli War, the Jews who've been in Egypt for since biblical times, some of them, become personae non grata. And they're all, not just Jews, but they're also sort of foreigners because they speak French. None of them really speaks Egyptian, speaks Arabic, sorry. They don't have Egyptian passports. And uh, so the elderly parents, you know, live out, their phone is cut off, Henri is jailed yet again. And so the family is sort of expelled and Henri ends up in Paris where he becomes quite a major figure of the post-colonial era. Henri leads this network called Solidarité, which helps anti-colonial movements all over the world, you know, from the PLO to the FLN in Algeria, South American movements, the ANC in South Africa. And they teach them, they train them in, you know, how to escape from jail, how to plant bombs, and they, um, they fund them. And so Henri becomes a, he lives in Paris as an alien, he never becomes French. He's a hate figure to the French far right, this Jew who's orchestrating these anti-colonial movements. And in 1978, on his way to yoga, like his cousin, he comes down in the lift in his apartment on the left bank, and somebody gums him down as he steps out the lift. He's assassinated by a hit squad that seems to have been linked to the Préfecture de Paris and the uh, Préfecture de Police in Paris. So uh, Henri is this major Cold War figure when it then emerges, when it's leaked that his, his cousin is this famous KGB agent, George Blake. It allows the far right to say, aha, I told you so, Curiel was really KGB. He does not seem to have been that. But yeah, so Curiel and Blake are strangely parallel lives. And I write about him partly because we always in Britain, I think we come to see Blake insofar as people care about him as a sort of figure in the lineage of the Cambridge spies, a sort of, you know, little brother of Philby Blake and uh, Philby Burgess and McLean, Cairn Cross and Blunt. And in fact, he comes from a very different tradition. He comes much more from a kind of, let's say a, a European uh, ideological tradition, which his cousin represents. One last thing I want to say about your, your point that short books are gratifying. I've moved very strongly towards that view myself. I'm now very reluctant to start reading a book that's more than about 250 pages. Very often I feel 
that with books after about 100 pages you get the message you know what the author wants to say um you either buy it or you don't and then the book just goes on and on sometimes for 500 pages and i feel often there's a lack of selection and an arrogance by the author who's trying to take your time to read 500 pages when half that would have sufficed and would have been no, actually, no. Like that too, right um, everyone's done it i guess i certainly have i mean i just got um, but but the, the material thing I think is fascinating because I thought the point where you say how he suddenly he can, he's viewed by other Egyptians as unacceptable as a liberation figure because he's not an Egyptian suddenly. I just kind of thought there's such an emblematic moment in the, the creation of the post-war world you know, that, that that switch where suddenly you know the, you cannot have someone who's not an Arab Arabic speaking Egyptian. Uh, so kind of human figure um, is 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 a must have been an enormous shock for. I mean, obviously it's an anti-international. I know the effectively the internationalist movements in the post war period are all to do with patching together people who have actually been sundered on national bases um, during the course of the arguments of the fifties. Well, an associate of um, Curiel's in Paris made the interesting point that Curiel had lost his homeland, just as Blake had lost his Dutch homeland. And this man, this pastor said, but you actually can't live without a homeland. So what people do in that situation is they adopt a homeland. And for both Blake and for Curiel, that homeland became the Soviet Union. And for Curiel, it was an imaginary homeland. He never went to the USSR, but for him, it was this, this paradise in whose service he was prepared to labor. And so, yeah, maybe the kind of communist ideal with the Soviet Union as the location of paradise appeal particularly to the people you're talking about who in this post-war turmoil turmoil had lost their homeland i think we should probably have a look at some questions but the um i just want to correct i mean i love i mean my like uh cool thing that i love is that we is the is britain in the 1950s which i think you deal with beautifully of this you know the, the the strangeness of this decompression of power, you know, the, the, the speed with which Britain goes from being, you know, a, a serious moral and practical victor of the Second World War to um, this sort of the state of collapse in which um, uh, Blake's own um, um, arrest is one of the key events. And, and, and again, you, you describe wonderfully this kind of this sort of series of fiascos which devastate the conservative governments of the mid 50s uh, to the point where Macmillan eventually just resigns in despair. That's the sheer inadequacy of Britain's response to its own situation and the degree to which Britain itself is riddled with people who turn out to be traitors and yet who themselves ought to be shining examples of everything that's good about this world. Um, and, but I think I I don't, is there anything you want to say particularly about that issue, or should we go on to questions? Just very briefly, it's a kind of period of British McCarthyism, and as we now know with McCarthy, there really were reds under the bed. You know, McCarthy was a lunatic and a, um, a, a liar, but he was correct in his presumption that there were quite a lot of communists knocking about in high positions, and that was more true of Britain. And so the effects of this finding out that your establishment is riddled with traitors is paranoia and we've seen that in the trump era as well that you then have this atmosphere of you too you're a russian asset and so people lose trust in the people at the top of their society often entirely you know incorrectly so in britain in the 60s there was this belief in sort of further right circles that the Prime Minister Harold Wilson, who's Prime Minister in the 60s and then the 70s, was a KGB agent. And, you know, at the time, one might have said it was ludicrous to believe that the leader of your country could be a Russian athlete. But now, of course, we, um, we're a bit more less naive about that. But anyway, Wilson was not a KGB agent. But in that, if a country has reached that level of paranoia, then you really have a problem. And that was sort of the most effective thing the KGB did. Not any of the information that Blake and Philby and so on passed on, much, much of which was ignored, never translated, but just the paranoia they sowed in British society. Yes, I thought that was one of the poignant aspects was how, you know, you have this crushing section on the fact that, you know, several dozen people were killed as a result of Blake's actions, but that equally, a lot of what the spies were doing 
was simply existing or being imagined to exist. And, and was effectively that was their real value was the, the, the degree to which they rattled the ability of uh, the Soviet, enemies of the Soviet Union to think rationally because they, yes, a world in which Harold Wilson is a KGB asset is a world where, uh, you know, which was obviously widely believed on the right and were, you know, highly respectable conservative uh, politicians and, uh, and important army men who throughout Harold Wilson's long period as prime minister were absolutely convinced he was working for the Russians. And so this wasn't a fringe paranoia. Um, but, but in that sense, Blake's work was well done. <laughs> um, and the, the influence he had was, was an indirect one based on the media as much as... Although the, the KGB at the time does not seem to have realised this, that, that paranoia was its great weapon, whereas Russia today seems much more aware that sort of peacefully dividing societies is the work they want to be doing. I guess Russia has moved like most societies away from militarization towards more sort of um, civil forms of propaganda, yeah. shall we say. Yeah. Uh, this question, um, how does your book differ from No Other Choice? Well, No Other Choice is Blake's, I think very well written autobiography, partly because it was edited by Philby. I did not have the privilege of having my book edited by Philby, but I think I've, tried to place Blake in the Dutch and foreign context in which he belongs. And I have tried to, although I mostly believe his accounts of his life, I think he's mostly accurate. I've tried to understand why, to try to see him from the outside in a way that he could not see himself. But I don't think that Blake was a liar particularly, but I think he was sort of blind to uh, aspects of what he did and why he did it. There's a question here, which I think has been answered by you uh, already really by uh, a question from uh, Kostis Papazilos saying, thank you, I'll definitely get the book. A question about the moment of conversion, Simon called it an epiphany in Korea. It seems to me that this is like adopting a familiar communist first-hand narrative of the moment of revelation. I wonder about Blake in Egypt and his connection to the Curiel family, more particularly Ori Curiel. Could one look for anti-colonial, anti-imperial origins purely in his late 1930s experience in Cairo? Um, so, sorry, I, I, about Curiel and his anti-colonial... Yeah, I, I think it's the same, to what extent could Blake have, in effect, been radicalised by being in Cairo earlier on? I think uh, Cairo was a sort of slow fuse event, but I think probably with all radicalizations and you know, the term of course we now use for jihadi terrorists, with all radicalizations, it's a drip drip. So with Blake, it's his father's business. He has a little shop making gloves and sports items, goes bankrupt in the great depression. He loses his homeland, the Netherlands. He never goes back there after 1943 to live again. So there's space for new loyalties. He starts to read about communism and starts to feel, well, maybe this is the ideal, the utopia, that he has this Korean experience. And also, I think a very important experience for him was at, in 1945-6 in Germany, he is tasked with using German marine officers, former German naval officers, to spy on the Soviet zone, what is now East, what became East Germany. So suddenly he's working with men, many of whom are former Nazis against the Soviet Union, who he had always seen as a great wartime ally. And that sort of makes him disenchanted, it casts an early disenchantment with the West. So when you ask about Curiel, I mean, I think that seeing with Curiel the terrible poverty, the Bill Hartzia, the preventable blindness, the early deaths of all these people around him, I think that did make an impact, the guilt about the wealth that they enjoyed. I mean, they had 10 servants, which in their milieu was not many. And then hearing from Henri about this new creed, communism, which is uh, anti-religious and therefore anathema to Blake at that age, he doesn't adopt it at that time. But Curiel, you know, for a teenage boy is a great hero figure. You know, he's this very kind of uh, real man, um, loads of girlfriends, uh he's uh he's charismatic he has this kind of trademark look of shorts and sandals 
And so I think that Curiel becomes a figure. They never see each other again after Cairo, but he becomes a figure in Blake's imagination who remains then when he comes into contact with communism, Curiel has biased him towards seeing it favorably. That's While Simon talked about his um, um, sophomore. Um, a question for both Simon K and Simon W. The Cold War is over, but the predicament of Britain's post-imperial shriveling, which was part of the Cold War for Blake, remains pertinent you know? And hence a way of thinking about Blake's life that there's something perhaps just a different kind of way. Could you talk a little about our fascination in Cold War espionage as a way of thinking about what has happened to Britain? Um, I think that's probably right. Everyone has occasional post-imperial shriveling. Um, and I think, and I suppose one of the oddities of British society has been that I suppose ever since I can remember, there's always been some final event which is going to sort of end this post-imperial process. Um, and that that post-imperial process always seems to have yet another facet. Um, uh, I mean, I would see, say, say for example, leaving the European Union as in a, in a straight line of, of a steady lack of belief uh, or steady lack of engagement with the rest of the world, uh, in which Brexit is, is very smoothly moves from decolonization. You know, it's, 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 it's a long running process. And when you're living through it, it's quite hard to spot it sometimes. It's the country's lack of self confidence becomes important. Perhaps um, I can out myself, Simon, as the asker of that question. Aha, uh -huh, anonymous attendee, there you go. And, and seize the opportunity to. To, to talk directly while while Simon Cooper is getting back on. Uh, it was I'm back on, by the way. Okay. On. Well, the, the, the question was really about what the fascination with British spies has to tell us about Britain's predicament as a kind of, you know, struggling with post-imperial decline. It seemed from what you said that, that what was important, a number of things were important to Blake here. And one of them was that, as you put it, he felt that this great center of the world as he saw it had ceased to be the center of the world. Uh, and I, wonder, I was curious to know what you both thought about that because it seemed to me that part of empire had always been the sense that you had a moral mission for the world. And uh, so there, there is somebody like Blake, arguably, and some other figures as well, who have a sense of their own moral purpose bound up with, bound up with it. It's deeply troubling to feel that the empire no longer exists as a moral force and is in fact being overtaken by other powers. And then if you, some of them are looking around for an alternative moral force. And for some reason, they're much more likely to find that in the Soviet Union than they are in the United States. I'm thinking about a book that I know Simon knows very well that was made into a film, Len Dayton's Billion Dollar Brain, where um, without giving the plot away, you end up with a, 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 a British Russian condominium against the United States led by a mad Texan millionaire. Um, it's America that comes across as the immoral power. So that was just a question for you both really about, about our general fascination with spies, you know, for this country that's taken itself out of Europe, uh, uh, arguably as a way of avoiding think about thinking now about where it really is in the world. Simon, do you want to go first? Yes, I mean, this is obviously a colossal subject, um, but yes, I think, you know, I, I was, was a moment, I think in about 1960, 1960, 61, certainly sometimes in the Macmillan government, where they actually discussed whether to demolish the foreign office on the grounds that the murals and statues and all the rest of it, the sort of the, the pictures of grateful Indian princes and the, the sort of allegories of plenty and the, all the consonants, or they just have to go because it's finished. Well, and I think they just cover them up and then they're, they're wheeled out again um, a generation later. Um, but like the, sort of the big sort of Durbar Hall kind of thing in the middle of the foreign office, or for a couple of generations was filled with uh, little cubicles uh, where people would work. And that seemed to sum up a, a, a sort of a realistic reuse of the, of, of the same space. And then 
uh, I think in the 90s, it, it's, all, it's all repaired. Um, and again, so you can see Britain on a more delusive, you know, the idea that you can actually go to work each day in the Foreign Office walking past a statue, you know, paintings of uh, Indian maidens hanging over plenty to, 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 to Queen Victoria. It's so obviously ridiculous um, that, effect, that effectively Britain never had that purge um, which would have, uh, have potentially moved it on in some way. Uh, and I, I find it impossible not to think of Brexit almost entirely in terms of this lack of self confidence. You know, you can, you know if you, you, you can understand that Britain has no power to project on what Australia does with itself or India um, or whatever. But the idea that Britain no longer has the ability or, or, or confidence to manipulate its own continent does seem to be like an incredible further step back. Effectively, it's a kind of admission of total weakness of a kind which is just very peculiar, but in some ways it's positive. In other words, it's, it's admitting that Britain doesn't have a great deal of power. But on balance, I tend to think it's, 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 a, it's a sort of it's painfully self-hating in as much as after all we're doing is negotiating with other large, to, large small and medium local democracies. You know, these aren't existential threats. This isn't the world. You know, Putin isn't the world of late. You know, the, 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 the issues are, are so much more day to day, and yet somehow petty issues to do with like meat processing or or you know, who gets to study where. Suddenly, somehow these are intolerable. Even these are intolerable. You know, it's a long way from sending a gunboat to blow up Chinese junks. You know, like so you could have a sort of long. And in some ways, this is attractive. I mean, effectively, it's a celebration of our marginality. But in other ways, it is a very peculiar response. But you can see Blake is this kind of, you know, the, 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 obviously, the, the, what's interesting about the Cambridge, this curious Le Carre going so recently, you know, the, the Carre um, effectively carried forward into the present the whole time, this world of who are these creators? What is it about Britain in the 50s uh, which makes Britain sort of hate itself in this way, you know? Um, and so the the the, the, the carrier's death sort of ends this that period um, of thinking of them as almost being current figures. They could be almost a current figure. And so, in some ways, Simon's book is like the first book to come out, which which is a uh, which which is being addressed to an audience which is new and which doesn't have those links which the carrier provided. Um, um, anyway, that's quite slightly free reading thought. But there we go. <laughs> I just will very briefly say that for the generation that joined British power when it was still a superpower and then saw the collapse, the disillusionment is much more drastic. So if you're Philby and you're raised in empire and your father's an imperial figure, and then by the time you get, you know, and Philby was already a communist, but by the time you get close to power, it's tin pot. Blake as well. That and for Blake, the dissolution comes in 1950 in the Korean War, where Britain goes in as America's aid. That is really shocking. And you thought, well, my career was going to be about running the world. But now it turns out that my career is just being a kind of yes man for America. And then you think, well, who is running the world? Who does have ideals? Uh, I'll go higher up. And so Philby joining KGB is a kind of um, promotion, you know, it's the real secret club. There's two very helpful questions from Simon Hodgson. One pointing out the demographics, as, an, as another Simon, he says the demographic spike of Simon's is in fact 1969 to 71 before the decline comes, falls, of, uh, uh, decline sets in. But he also says, thank you very much for talking about your book, Simon. I will definitely read it. I'm interested in the title of the word traitor. On a personal level, they are doubtless deceived and betrayed colleagues and agents. But I wonder if someone with his biography, multicultural and polyglot, can be called a traitor in the emotional sense that's sometimes used by so-called patriots. I address that question. It's a very good question. I address it in the book. And the idea of a traitor is you betray your own country, which, of course, legally Blake did. I mean, he was working for the UK and he betrayed it. But emotionally, he didn't. I mean, he never felt particularly British. The longest stint he ever spent in Britain was the five years he spent in Wormwood Scrubs. And he didn't hate Britain at all. On the contrary, he was an Anglophile. He was quite fond of Britain. He, uh, you know, into old age, he would, um, he inherited Donald McLean's British library. He loved Le Carre. He listened to the BBC. 
And his conversion to communism all the way was guided by various mentors from the British establishment, including Vivian Hunt, the uh, consul in Korea, who I mentioned. Donald McLean becomes his final mentor of the British establishment when they become best friends and soulmates in the USSR. So no, Blake did not see himself as a traitor to Britain. He never felt that he was acting against Britain. He felt he was acting for communism against capitalism. He saw it as an idealistic struggle. So he did not see himself as working for representing a nation in this struggle. There's one final interesting question, which is, um, do you think that Blake liked you? That's a good question. I think he enjoyed talking, speaking Dutch to me, speaking to somebody who knew the Netherlands in his own language that he so seldom got a chance to spoke. I think there was a kind of memory lane aspect to talking to me. I think he was a polite and decent person who actually had sort of stopped caring very much about the world around him. And I was just some bloke he was never gonna see again. But he did call Sauer and say that he had really enjoyed our conversation and had a good time, which was the sense I had as well. And in fact, at the end of the conversation, he, I said to him, and I meant it, I said, is there anything I could send you from the Netherlands? And uh, he said, well, you know, if it's not too difficult, I'd be very grateful for some Dutch herring or cheese. And at that moment, I genuinely intended to send it. But when I came home and told my wife this story about this amazing man I'd read, I'd met, she said, but hang on, he sent 40 people to their deaths. You're going to send this guy some herring. So in the end, I didn't send him any herring. And I thought about it and I wrote the book in a kind of um, non-herring gift sort of way. So uh, I quite liked him. He, I think, quite liked me, but it, it wore off. It's a great moral moment, the decision not to send the herring. It's, it's, you, you passed. Okay. That's a very Le Carre kind of moment, actually, isn't it? Low stakes. Mark, is there anything you'd like to inter inter interview on? Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Simon Cooper, for talking about the book so interestingly. And, and Simon Winter, thank you for being such a wonderful uh, 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 maitre d' and, and conversationalist. I, I mean, there are so many things that I would still like to ask you both about, actually, and uh, hear about Blake. That, that The herring does lead off in a very interesting direction, which we will have to wait for another time but so just let me thank you let me thank those who've joined us for for listening i i, I found this very thought-provoking and will take it away with me